esteemed authors. And I'd like good, to see Lisa Lisney, yeah. um, another marketing manager. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Hi, and thanks so much for uh, joining us this afternoon. So our two presenters today are Deb Page and Judith Hale. Um, Deb is a strategy and performance consultant in systemic improvement of performance. She was awarded the Evidence-Based Certified Performance Technologist Job Certification in 2011 by the International Society for Performance Improvement, which is ISPI, based on her work in education improvement. Deb's a former K-12 educator who spent more than 20 years in corporate human capital management. She began her career as a high school teacher after graduating from the University of Georgia with a BS in language education. In 2001, she left her position as Senior Vice President for Instruction and Business Development for Citibank to form Willing Learner Incorporated. In 2002, she led the start of the Georgia Leadership Institute for School Improvement, which is a public and private initiative to improve education leadership. Under her leadership, the Institute developed a solid track record for helping school systems improve student achievement and organizational effectiveness. Through her company, Willing Learner Incorporated, she provided strategic planning support and performance consulting services. Judith Hale is one of ISPE's more prolific writers and well-known consultants in the field of performance improvement, certification, and sustaining major interventions. She's the author of a number of different titles, Performance-Based Certification, The Performance Consultant's Field Book, Outsourcing Training and Development, Performance-Based Management, and performance-based evaluation. She served as Director of Certification and President of ISPE. Judith was awarded a BA from Ohio State University in Communications, a Master's from Miami University in Communications, and a PhD from Purdue University in Instructional Design. Her doctoral research was on how to control bias in competency studies. Judy and Deb have launched a new venture now, um, the Institute for Performance Improvement, uh, L3C, dedicated to preparing professionals in the practice of human performance technology as it is applied to school improvement. They will apply project-based learning principles to help consultants, both internal and external, to develop proficiency in performance improvement, performance consulting, evidence-based certification, and six 21st century skills, collaboration, complex communication, critical thinking and problem solving, creativity, comprehensive digital literacy, and consultative facilitation. And uh, with that intro, I will turn it over to uh, Judy. Judy, are you, um, are you online? Give us a moment. Stephanie, this is Deb. If you're having trouble connecting with Dr. Hale, I can get us started. Yes, please. 
Okay. And I know that Judy is uh, is signed in, and I know that she's planning to uh, join us. But we can go ahead and um, and get started. Are you going to give me the um, give me the controls there? Sure. Thank you. Okay, hang on a second. Give a chance for a few more people to get signed in. Can you hear me now? This is Judy. Yes, perfect. Um, I will assign controls over to you again. Okay. Apologies for that. You should have. You should now have control of this, and we can now hear you. Uh, great. This is Judy again. I apologize for that. I could hear everyone, so I couldn't understand why no one could hear me. So please let me know again if there's any problems with the audio. We don't need that. It's important to everybody here. What I was going to do before I turn this over to Deb, and to be more specific, who will be more specific about education, I was talking about human performance improvement as a discipline has been around for that, uh, uh, has been around for a good 50 years. And in that process, uh, across all industries, uh, people who practice this are in finance, healthcare, military, government, uh, technology, uh, retail. Uh, we even have them in prisons everywhere. And I don't mean as felons, but I mean the people who work in the corrections world. And what we have found is that they have a common process. Independent of their venue, independent of their industry, we learned in our research that they have this common process. And what we're going to be talking about today is that process and how it might apply to education. So it's, the question is, is there a common process for education? And uh, if not, uh, maybe there can be one, okay? So uh, with that, I would like to turn this quickly over to Deb. Well, thank you, Judy. And our educators that are here on the phone with us know that the slide that's here represents the challenge that's before us all as educators, and that's the solutions to all the problems of our time really depend on education. And if you look at the icons that are here, hopefully it will conjure up your ideas of some of the things that challenge us as a nation and as a world. Judy, you can advance. And we know that if our students are going to have the type of complex skills that they need to communicate, collaborate with peers and work teams around the nation, around the country, and around the world to be able to really master complex communication, the explaining, selling, negotiating, and the types of skills that they need to create and innovate to really um, innovate solutions to the problems of our day and achieve breakthroughs. And if our nation and if our world is to prosper, our students today must be successful. One way to look at that is uh, a friend of mine said, if you're sitting in the nursing home and someone comes in to take care of you and it's one of your former students, it forces us to reflect on how much we hope that we're able to help those people be successful in their future because our future is in their hands. And our economists, U.S. economists predict that this economic downslide that the United States has had pales in comparison to what we will face if our students are not able to succeed in the 21st century and solve the challenges of our future. And so when Judy and I first began doing this research, we were thinking about the people who were, who were successful in facilitating changes in schools to be able to 
change edu their education and teaching and learning so that students were prepared for the 21st century, who were those people and how were they doing it? And <clears throat> what we began to see is that there really wasn't a unified process for how people were facilitating that type of change, but we knew that the quality the keys to quality of life for everybody in our nation and world were in the hands of those adults who are teaching uh, our students to be successful in the future. So we began to focus on what what is the role of people who are facilitating improvement in our schools? And you'll recall that in two, back in 2002 with the advent of No Child Left Behind, for the first time we had national accountability requirements. And many of those um, compliance mandates requirements required for there to be an individual who was sent in who was external to a low performing school that became to be known in most states as someone who's a school improvement specialist. And that person is assigned to be the facilitator of the turnaround or the transformation of those st struggling schools. And as the school improvement grants have come forward, we see very precise language about turnaround and transformation. And so while we were studying some successful turnarounds, we found out that the school improvement specialists in those schools that we were doing case studies of were all working autonomously and had figured out, figured out autonomous, autonomously how to facilitate the improvement process. And what we realized was is that our peers who had been doing human performance improvement facilitation for the last 20 years had some practices that were used across all sectors that could be beneficial to our colleagues who were trying to facilitate education improvement. And so at this point, we I was I happened to be working on my uh, certified performance technologist certification at the time that I was doing this research for the Department of Education. And so I uh, turned to Judy because I knew that she had this strong background in human performance improvement and in certification and accreditation. So Judy, I'll turn it back to you. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, what happened is that uh, ISPI codified what it takes to have sustainable improvement in any organization. They did that work uh, over a decade ago. And the point, and then the people who participated in that, again, across all industries. Uh, we had high tech, we had uh, finance, uh, uh, academia. We had this group, and, and they came to say, what, what are these common things that result in sustainable improvement? A lot of groups can come in and get blips. They can come in and do miracles and turn things around. But once they leave, it goes back. It regresses to what it was. So we were looking at sustainability as in terms of real performance. And that's what produced the certified performance technologist. It is evidence-based, if you will. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that uh, there's a difference between being certified versus getting certificates. Certificates, you, we all get certificates because you uh, participate in something, uh, you attend a class or take a course. But certifications, however, are evidence of proficiency. And they may be evidence-based, which is what the CPT is, and which is what the school improvement credentials is. Or they could also be based on a test or some combination. The CPT does not have a test. You have to prove with three different projects that you have produced sustainable improvement. And we took that thinking and working with Deb and transferred that to the school improvement. So what are these principles, if you will, uh, that we're working from? First of all, it's called how we think. And this is, I think, perhaps what distinguishes us more. It's a real focus on results, not on inputs, not just on process, but on what are we trying to accomplish? So are we clear? Do we agree? And is that worthy? The systemic view is a recognition that any organization, schools included, are complex political, economic, uh, social entities. And you can't work as if they're just some, uh, like a chessboard, and you can move the pieces around and change will be sustained. No, you have to work within real constraints. 
Another is you have to add value in the process. And one way of adding that value is by building capacity in the people, in, in the organization, so they can sustain their work over time. And partnership. By the way, uh, we've been told this is upside down. It should start with partnership. No sustainable change happens without partnership. And I would agree with that. Uh, if you come in and do things to people, it will not last. But if you come in and work with them and collaborate with them, it increases the odds of sustainability. And finally, there's a systematic process. That's what we mean. But we, we have the process. This is the one, the common process. Is what are we trying to solve? What's the real need here? What are the barriers? What's causing it? We look at solutions, and uh, we know that if you really want sustainable change, a silver bullet will not do it. Sustainable change is a complex, requires a complex set of solutions. You need to then make sure that those solutions get really implemented. Deb's words are fidelity of implementation. Okay? And then you have to really evaluate that impact. Did it really happen and be able to tell the story that way? So what we have here is we say human performance improvement. Well, that's because people are important. And that's because uh, people, I don't know how many organizations exist without people. People make decisions. People do the work. Uh, people are the heart and soul of everything. So our mantra is that performance is worthy work of people. And worthy work is that which is valued because of was accomplishment. Uh, so we have to identify, did I just go back? I seem to have be going forward here. Okay. Now what I was doing here is, Deb, would you like to talk? Uh, let's hear some feedback from our group. Why don't you take over? Well, thank you, Judy. Um, as I've been working for um, several years now with uh, school improvement facilitators and for about the last decade for people who I've been preparing to go in and facilitate school improvement, especially in improving leadership, um, I often hear back from them that this focus on, they knew that schools were about people, but this focus on human performance improvement was sort of a different lens to look through. So when you think of the people who are assigned either as administrators or instructional coaches or they're assigned from state departments or districts to go in and facilitate school improvement, what examples have you seen that they are really focusing on the adults in the building as a, as a resource in order to be able to improve student success? What examples do you see that, that shows that school improvement really is about helping adults get better? And you're uh, welcome to raise your hand or chat or? Yes, I was going to say, please raise your hand or chat and we'd like to hear from you. If you could either chat to Corwin Press or to Stephanie Triquet, I can read out the, the responses. Well, then while we're waiting maybe for some of the people to respond here, I certainly can give you non-examples. I can give you okay. examples of pe people who come in to try and make an improvement, and they're just focused on the process of work, not necessarily the people who follow those processes. They focus on buying and choosing technology. If we have better computers, faster technology, or they focus only on the buildings and facilities. It doesn't mean that those things are unimportant. Of course they're important. But... If they're done in isolation and they're not, and they don't take into consideration the people, the people's values, what they believe in, recognizing the behaviors, uh, getting them wanting to change how they're doing it, it, it won't last. So I can buy this, I can put you in a beautiful building and I can give you the latest technology. But if the people do not have the shared vision and they do not have those things, then we have some problems that way. Oh, 
would you like this to go on? And we're, and we're going to, we should tell everyone, we're going to be doing this throughout. We're going to be asking to hear from you. So, Deb, why don't we take it to the next one here? Oh, before and you move on, I actually did receive one. Um, excellent. That's from, from Mike. Um, he says, they listen to how the school works instead of telling them how to make it work. Exactly. And one of the things that I've often I saw in some of our turnaround cases is that the um, the administrators and the uh, school improvement facilitators were trying very hard to figure out if the school was an adult employment agency or if it was really adults that were there for the kids. And when they established that the adults really were there for the kids, then as he suggested, it was less of saying, okay, you do this and you do this and you do this, where people were just sort of willing to follow whatever you said and just went along in compliance. But as, he's just, as our colleague has suggested, it's where it really becomes their work. They have a vision for it. And as Judy said, that's more likely to be sustainable. So that's right on. Judy, tell us about the performance improvement part of the equation. So the performance improvement really is that systematic process, and it's saying, so what is, what's really required in this case? What's really required for children to learn? Okay, what gets in the way? What's preventing it from happening? It's asking some hard questions about that, and then saying, okay, if we know what's required and we know what's preventing, then what do we need to do to, one, make sure that people have what's required and we can mitigate, offset those barriers that get in the way? And that's why the approaches are what we call multidimensional. There's no single silver bullet. It's not a new teaching machine or it's not a new uh, model for building lessons. Those are very, very important. But unless they're looked at as an integrated whole, they will not, it won't work over time. So I'd like to hear from our folks on the line. Um, how does this how does what you just described resonate with their thinking because what what I have seen in working with legislators and working with um, with you know many many school districts and leaders that sometimes um, people come forward with the program of the day or a new idea or maybe something that worked down the road and they end up plugging in a lot of programs and before they know it they have programs maybe they were grant funded or whatever but they don't not people are not even sure really why those programs exist and sometimes they have to go through sort of a strategic abandonment to get back in alignment with their strategy and their school improvement plan and what they're really focused on so i'd like to to hear from uh, folks in the audience about what is what is your experience or your thoughts about the importance of the focus on comprehensive interventions rather than just programmatic interventions. What do you think? Why is that important to successful school improvement? And I can see that we have Cheryl out there, Cheryl Booker and Cheryl Meyer and Rhea, Lori, Desiree, Robert, Mike, uh, Sarah, uh, a couple others, Vernosa, Ver, Vernora, I'm sorry. So um, we know you're there and we'd like to know what you're thinking. Certainly welcome to raise your hand or chat in or t chime in. Um, okay, it looks like there's a little bit of confusion as to what the question is, um, and there, would it be possible to rephrase what, what it is that we're asking? Yes. Um, in their experience, what about, um, I ask it this way, what is the advantage of taking a comprehensive approach to putting together the right set of solutions for your school as opposed to just implementing single programs? We often to go into schools that they may have, you know, a district may have 350 different reading programs, 
and they really struggle with getting that alignment. So why is taking being able to sort of step back and take a comprehensive approach rather than plugging in programs the real work of school improvement specialists? And what is their experience with that? Either examples or non examples. People may be typing right now. We'll give you um, a few more uh, seconds to type. Okay, we do have a response. Um, programs can operate independently. We must look at how they integrate with one another. Another response. Um, funding comes from programming, and then you have to put into it the bigger picture. Hard to manage without the big picture, hard to find time to work from the top down. Um, also, with any programs, there won't be overnight success. So, um, this is another response. So, to me, it's important for the administration or whatever governing body to not just implement initially, but to focus on deeper understanding and implementation. Um, rather than keep having different programs all the time. That's exactly. And what our school improvement specialist told us during our research was is that their job was to come in and sort of wrap their mind around what's going on in the school, what, what really the results need to be, what programs are in place, and be able to get a very tight line of sight between the, their analysis of the, of the school team and their inquiry into the current state of the school and develop these short cycle action plans and making sure that if there are programs, they are drawn into that alignment that our colleagues pointed to. And that sometimes, as we said earlier, some of those have to be strategically abandoned. But the role of the school improvement facilitator is to come in and sort of sit at the elbow of that administrator, or that district, or that government entity, and help them begin to get a, a, a clear view of what's happening, what are the factors at play, and what things are within the control of the people who work in the schools, and which things have to be addressed by those who support the schools. So Judy, take us on to the next slide. What we've learned is that we can focus on environmental supports, and we can also focus on a person's repertoire of behavior, if you will, which is what Deb was talking about and describing, however. But we we try to take a more systems approach so that we look at a little bit of everything. We're going to certainly consider capacity building, but it's only if people lack the capacity. Why would you go out and train people if they already know it? But if they're not motivated or if they don't believe it's going to work or they say this is the flavor of the month. In, in the corporate world, uh, there's a lot of passive aggressive behavior because people know that it's just what, it, it's literally the flavor of the month, the flavor of the year. And if you wait long enough, it'll be abandoned and, and disappear. So it's just a matter of waiting. So they've actually taught workforce to kind of uh, pretend to be engaged, but they're not really engaged. And I think What's happening in the schools is that we don't want to have that same thing happen. But I certainly know in our result of our research that we see so many things being imposed on the school, but there's no integrated view, if you will. So we're going to look at what's really going on in the marketplace, the workplace, uh, the work. We're going to look at the whole piece and see how that works together. And one of the things that we found when we look across all sectors is the most common intervention that's applied to improve performance is capacity building. And understandably, when we interviewed tons and tons and tons of school improvement facilitators and administrators and their supervisors, they told us that they felt that their primary role was capacity building, and that they felt like their job was to transfer capacity to the people in the buildings that they served so that when they were no longer there, people were able to do the work on their own and felt like they owned it. And they also told us that there were some times that they were using training as an action vehicle to get people on the same page, to get them to come to common agreement. But what we found looking at um, research overall 
is that it is the most overused intervention. And as Judy said, often we begin with training as our capacity building or coaching as our first intervention when we've not yet identified and begun to address some of the things that may be preventing good people from being able to do the work. And we truly believe that there's very few people who just drive into work every day determined to come in and just mess it up for the children and everybody, although some of you I can see smiling probably that you know some people that may be a, um, a non-example in that case. But as we always say, don't, don't try this at home. But a way to determine is whether you need to do training and capacity building with the people that you're serving. And it's almost always something that's needed. But it's to think about if the person's life depended on it, could they do it? You know, we didn't say don't try this at home. If you put a gun to their head, could they do the work? Because if they can do the work but they're not doing it, there's something that's involved in the work or the workplace or the work context that's either uh, creating a, a motivation or consequence for them not to be able to do the work as they really are truly able to do it. So Judy's going to show you how we focus on in human performance improvement on four performance factors. Because if we look at these, often we find that although our teachers may need capacity building, our administrators may need that for our schools to improve, there are lots of other things that need to be done or need to be um, accounted for, responded to, in order for those people to be successful so our kids can be successful. So Judy, show us, uh, let us look at schools through the four lens of human performance improvement. Well, let's talk about the marketplace or the external environment. I have to believe that schools, I know in other industries are definitely affected by the globalization of what's going on. Uh, we have uh, work being offshore or going to other places. We have uh, other companies uh, building new products that are being sold internally to the states. Well, that has to be similar, similar happening in schools. We're expecting our children, for example, to be able to work throughout the world. We're expecting to be uh, uh, multilingual. We're expecting them to really understand the logistics of global commerce. And then there's the workplace. This is the work environment itself. This is leadership, this is buildings, this is facilities, this is systems, but it's also, uh, uh, if you will, the people in leadership and whether or not they're consistent and clear in the direction. And then there's the work itself. It's, uh, it's a clarity in roles, relationships, and responsibilities. Uh, and, and are we really making sure the people are doing the right work in the right time in the right way? And then finally, we have the people themselves. Do they have the skills? Do they have the abilities? Do they have the motivation to do that particular work? So we'd like to, to open this up to chats or hand raise and really think about the marketplace of education today. Uh, I, heard a lot, I hear a lot of people saying that public education is more challenged than it ever has been. I often hear people saying, gosh, I just don't know if we can do what we're being challenged to do. Um, but also see a lot of good things going on out there. So when you're describing to, to peers or family members or others who may not truly understand the, the marketplace of education, what are the things that you see in the external environment that are impacting our, our schools and the work, we, work adults do in schools? What type of factors are out there in the marketplace that are impacting schools and schools' performance? If you chat those up, we'd like to um, sort of unpack those. Stephanie, are you seeing any chat responses? No, people are, are pretty quiet on this question. 
Just generally, um, what I hear most often is people talking about the um, national policy uh, opportunities and uh, for for funding for innovations like in Race to the Top. At the same time, there might be we have new accountability systems in the nation around as we've gone from our No Child Left Behind to our ESA waivers. We have um, a lot of public schools say they feel begin to feel uh, a little bit more um, competition, perhaps, for students. We see that as we're going to new types of uh, learning, like students being able to move on with ready or even assessments of prior learning for uh, college students and that type of thing, um, the whole issue of full-time uh, uh, enrollment figures, now uh, full-time enrollment funding being shared with uh, college and universities, is creating a very complex marketplace for schools. If you look at the workplace of, of educators, our, work, our schools are usually, in many, many places around the country, they're our largest employers in our community. And it is a place where adults go to work in order to serve children. But those same workplaces are challenged by, by funding, by, um, I know in our state we have seen a huge um, turnover in baby boomers and newer people coming into the workplace, often saying that they feel like their preparation has not really prepared them for what they're, they're there and able to do. If you look at the work of educators, right now we are just smack in the middle of common core and new types of assessments and expecting our, our, our teaching to produce learning that is uh, higher up uh, Bloom's taxonomy or students to be able to do more project and inquiry based learning, which many of our educators were not prepared to, um, to develop and deliver that type of training. And it's all new work for them. And it's, um, it's good people who are challenged to, to do new work. And so often we come back with people pointing and saying it's the teachers or it's the administrators, it's the people in schools. Whereas we don't really step back and say, this is a complex set of factors. And in order for our school improvement plans and our work to be effective and to be sustainable, we have to take into context the things like people's motivation to do it, the support, appropriate support they need over time to do it. And school improvement specialists are often sent in to work at the instructional core uh, without really having access to some of these larger systems of work, including um, being able to support, select, and train uh, people that are in the building. So it's a rather, education is a very complex entity, but sometimes from a policy point of view, um, or just a practical point of view, sometimes we see it as, um, as not being, as sim as being more simple, especially people from the outside um, view it as something that they think they understand, but they really don't understand the complexity in the marketplace, workplace, and work of our educators, practitioners today. Judy? We did also get some feedback, um, you know, and, and maybe this is something that you can speak on also, that um, it sounds like, and I don't know if this is specific to the marketplace or the work and workers, but um, it's, it seems like people are getting more criticism rather than positive feedback. Um, so I think that, that impacts um, performance. Exactly. Go ahead, Deb. Exactly. And, and for example, if you look at Race to the Top, one of the things that Race to the Top mandates is that schools will have pay for performance. Well, if you're a school improvement specialist who's working in, a, say, a turnaround or a low-performing school or a transformational, say, school improvement grant model, you're also challenged that your district may also be a Race to the Top district. So they're having to work on these big systemic changes like teacher evaluations, performance evaluations. At the same time, we have common core and, and um, new assessments. And so what we see sometimes is with new evaluation systems, we have teachers who are very anxious about learning their new craft and want to do a good job. At the same time, they're in a high stakes environment that could even push us towards pay for performance. So at the same time, they need positive feedback and development. They also can feel we often hear teachers saying we're feeling more challenged than ever before because our work is new, the stakes are high, and we're the one with our with our necks on the line. So uh, it's still improvement really 
really becomes um, not just working to turn around the work at the instructional core, but how do you overall create systems of support for teachers and administrators so that everybody can be successful, so our students can be successful, and how we can address underperformance, have clear expectations, clarity, uh, as Judy was mentioning. Do oh, we have any other Judy. feedback or comments? Go ahead, Judy. I was going to add one of the other marketplace factors is that schools are under more scrutiny than ever before. The media is watching everything, and and they're, so so it's like everyone's like under a big magnifying glass. And and the purpose is not to be helpful. I think sometimes it's to be blemish picking. They're all looking for the mistakes, the errors, so they can, um, if you will, uh, grandize them, so they can sell more media. And it's not very helpful at all. So many of the adults in the education system, I think rightfully so, are beginning to feel more like victims than they really are being honored for having capabilities that way. Uh, do we, if we have any other feedback, we can go ahead. So uh, Tracy, tell me. Okay, Stephanie, if we don't have anything then, what we were going to do then is... Um, uh, yes, we have one more um, feedback. I'm we sorry, have, please go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. We have, I'm not sure that the performance itself is compensated enough in the first place. These negative news doesn't help it either. Well, that's, uh, this is Judy, that certainly is, uh, I will tell you from my perspective, uh, the role of education is grossly undervalued in this country compared to other countries. But it, it's, uh, we have that horrible joke, and if you can't do it, you teach. And uh, that has done tremendous damage. And I would certainly agree, you know, but at the same time, when you uh, increase the economic value, which I think they should, that's Judy speaking, by the way, not anybody else, uh, comes with that is even increased accountability. So you have to be careful what you ask for. So if you get more money, then you have to make sure the other systems are in place to make sure you're successful. So you don't want to be set up to particularly fail, which leads us to this transition, the concept of facilitation. Um, we're finding in the school improvement, it, it's the, and this is the, the engagement, the participation part, you, you do provide advice, but you, and you facilitate decisions, and you confront assumptions like, uh, is our economic model really one reflective of the importance of this work and the skills required to do this work? Okay, I think, I think we've greatly uh, misjudged what it takes to be a, a teacher uh, in, under all these demands. And so, so we have to, if you will, address those assumptions, things like that. But a school improvement person can't come in with the big finger or should, the blaming, the name calling. They really have to turn that energy around to something constructive. And they do that through a facilitation. And hard questions like what's really feasible for us this year or the next month or whatever? What can we take on? What, what's really getting in our, in our way that we're willing to address? And then you have to do that in a way to Encourage people so they see progress, they see movement forward, they feel not disenfranchised, but they feel as an integral part and valued in what they're doing. And, and it requires uh, everyone working together. What do we need, whether that be buildings or technology or more teachers or whatever? How do we make that happen? And then, again, what Deb says is the fidelity of implementation. We all have great ideas, but it's getting it really implemented and you don't implement these changes overnight. It takes months, it takes years to turn uh, systems around. And we're as a nation, we're very impatient. We want instant, uh, if you will, or instant solutions. That's naive. So part of that facilitation is that confronting those issues and say, excuse me, we are making progress, this is what we're doing. And uh, the goal is to continue moving forward, if you will, that way, then rather than seeing uh, an instant kind of change. And 
Uh, I'm going to jump jump over this question for the sake of time, but one thing that we found in our research was as we began to get school improvement facilitators that had really been successful in in facilitating and turning around schools, whether they were administrators or they were people assigned externally, (coughs) what they told us was that reflecting on their practice made them think about how they got people to do the what the work of transforming the instructional core and making changes in teaching and learning and the systems of support, and that they began as they began to talk about how they facilitated this change and improvement, they began looking at each other and say, well, I do it this way, and then when I get to this point, I think about this, and this is how I say it. And what we began to see, and Jude, let's move on, is that there were some very particular um, uh, ways that they focused on results, that they were looking at things systemically, that they were creating value, they were creating partnership, and they were systematic. But then when we asked them, have you ever had any training in the facilitation of the school improvement process? Of all the people we interviewed, we only had one person who said, you know, generally when I'm assigned, I'm told to go to a school. I'm usually assigned because I'm geographically matched to that school. But And I may be getting from my state or my district or my consulting company a body of, of content of what we're going to try to help that school to do. But no one is really focused on what I need to do in order to facilitate this to make people successful. So, Judy, let's go on to the next So we were were thinking about what we the the tenets of human performance improvement. You know that you look at the marketplace, the work, the workers, the workplace. That you add value, work in partnership, the things that you've seen. And so as we began to interview those people, we began to see very common bodies of practice of how these successful turnaround administrators and and school improvement people. Um, how they were truly successful. And we really began to see the difference between their behaviors and people that were not as successful. And so we were able to interview them and come up with the 10 standards that you see here. Now, although they are numbered, this is not a a lockstep process. You can analyze and apply critical judgment anytime, every day, anytime that you're facilitating um, improvement of a school or a school district or even a state agency. But there are certain things that you do at the beginning, they told us, when they go in at the beginning of assignment that are necessary to do before they engage people in the work and talked about how they facilitated deriving meaning and engagement from the people in the school how they would look at systemic factors, looking at the gap between where the school is and where it needs to be, looking at the underlying causing causes. They all talked about planning and recording because, of course, everybody has school improvement plans. But once they really, we really began to think about, okay, how deep do your plans go, they said, we really need to be better in project planning and action planning, and we really need to be better at keeping records of our work and our plans so that if we leave the process, somebody else comes in, there's continuity and sustainability. If, if, if number four is about project planning or school improvement planning, number five is about organizing, managing, using distributed leadership, and the ways that they ensure that the work is is managed and 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 begins to be monitored. Monitored. Number six is all about what we know is the heart of the school improvement process: that it's collaborative work. Seven is what they described as their coaching, their training, their building capacity. But they also talked about building capacity by having the right people in the right job. Some were frustrated because they said they never had contact with the central office. Some said we work hand in glove with the central office to make sure we have the right teachers and the right people and the right support, you know, in the right seats on the bus and going in the right direction, as you know. Uh, and then they talked about organizational sensitivity. Uh, one really savvy school improvement specialist talked about, you know, when she goes in doing her first uh, class from observations, uh, how she never wore a suit because she didn't want to be off-putting to the teachers, how she always left a note thanking the teacher. And things that they did to make sure that they were attendant to how people felt and what they thought, and and you all know the heart of school improvement process, the organizational culture and bringing that culture along. They talked about how they monitored accountability and adoption of improved practices and then the process of implementing implementing for sustainability. 
overall people told us that they felt weakest on really some of the um, short cycle action planning and monitoring and what they really need to do to make sure that that the work is sustainable after the time that they are there. And when you break these down, you go into our book or you go to our website and you look at these, these are broken down just like you have uh, standards for students in the classroom or in Common Core, they're broken down to the element level. And these apply to the facilitation of any education improvement model or intervention set. So if the model you have for reform or turnaround or transformation, the what is the content that your school or your district is using, then, the, um, then this is the how you get people to do it. <clears throat> Judy? I'm trying to make it advance. So there it goes. So what we have built then is an evidence-based certification that's very much like the certified performance technologist that's offered by the International Society of Performance Improvement. And an individual documents their practice in facilitating systemic school improvement against the 10 certified school improvement specialist standards. You have a series of you have the standards at the element level. You have a series of questions, and you simply describe the work that you have done uh, in facilitating improvement. And it does require you to triangulate data so that you can show the correlation or the connection between what you did as a school improvement specialist, then what work was done in the school because of that systemic work, how you helped them develop their plans, how they carried out those plans, what they implemented, and then um, and at the end of the day, what the results were and the impact on student achievement. And as you document that and you submit your evidence, one of the things that educators tell me they're most challenged by, because we're very collegial people, uh, is to talk about what I did in facilitating this as administrator, instructional coach, uh, or a uh, school improvement specialist, because you're being certified as an individual school improvement facilitator rather than as what you're doing as, a, as necessary as a leadership team, although your work will always reflect like standard uh, six, I believe it is, that it's collaborative improvement. Your application comes to the Institute for Performance Improvement, and we use a double-blind review uh, to train raters who recommend whether the person is ready for certification or not. If they recommend that they're ready, it goes to our certification governance committee, who then rules on the recommendations of the rater and awards the certification. This is a national certification. What we're finding is that there is a trend we work closely with the U.S. Department of Education and various state education agencies to now um, look towards requirements and assurances that people who do school improvement work that are funded by federal funds are people who are able to certify that they have demonstrated proficiency and the ability to facilitate school improvement work. Judy? So, Judy, will you describe for them this process? Certainly, if uh, you are interested, you can get the uh, application for free. You get the standards for free. That doesn't cost you anything. So we would, first of all, encourage you to do that and reflect on that work and look something like that. We also, of course, uh, we're here at being sponsored by Corwin, to say we'd also encourage you to get a copy of our book. And by the way, Corwin may not know this, but the book was just awarded an international uh, excellence award for instructional communication. So we're very, very proud of that. So you can, anyway, you can we encourage you to look at the book. We encourage you to find the, go online here and uh, get the, uh, uh, get the uh, application and get the standards and, and learn how to do that. We ask you to document your work against the standards. And it, it, you can come in and you can submit it. And uh, in doing that, You'll either be told you're certified or you'll be told you need to work on these areas, you need to clarify certain pieces of information. Why don't you tell them about the portfolio piece, Deb? And they're able, you're able to con collect your evidence. This is a portfolio that's being used for uh, performance management. You'll see a superintendent there with our president. And you'll see how, in this case, your performance goals. Well, in this case, your performance goal would be the language of the standard. And you can build your own portfolio that evidences your ability as a school improvement administrator, school improvement facilitator, 
uh, and you're able to have this to both submit your application and your evidence for certification or just to use as a reflection on practice. It has uh, um, social media 2.0, um, web 2.0 methodology so you can communicate with other peers who are school improvement specialists or administrators or even people that, that work in your district. Judy, you can keep going. Our time is near here. Another example of how people bring their data together, put together their portfolio, their files, their resumes, their goals, those types of things, a very personalized process. And they were also rolling out a certification for schools that demonstrate sustained improvement meeting and exceeding the, uh, their accountability standards. It's based on the same certified school improvement specialist standards that you've seen, but rather than being an individual certification, it's based on documentation by the leadership team, and it is a recognition for schools that have turned around, transformed, or the good schools that have really gone to be great schools. And both of these are national certifications, and we are seeing um, now that state education agencies are beginning, when they put out their RFPs for school improvement specialists, they're beginning to look for uh, school improvement specialists as members of those teams for state and federally funded projects, as well as supporting our uh, efforts to help schools that have improved gain this recognition as certified schools of improved performance. We work very closely with Carlos McCauley, who's over the six schools at the U.S. Department of Education. Of course, here's our book, and you notice that our colleagues at uh, Corwin have allowed you to have a discount code, N141F7, that you can get a 20% um, uh, uh, off the book when you order it. And I know that they also sometimes organizations that want to do volume orders. Uh, we've our Corwin College. You can help them with bulk uh, orders. Is that correct? That's correct. If you have, um, if you're starting to order in bulk for um, your staff, we do offer pretty deep discounts. Sometimes deeper than the 20%. Um, and and as we're sort of um, wrapping up here, I do want to let folks know that we have been recording and we'll be providing the recording um, to the folks that have attended and maybe those that, that can attend um, this evening. Um, are we, uh, are you okay with us sharing your slides as well? I, I know I'm getting a couple of questions about that. Yes, uh, we, we can do that. And then if they would like our slides, they can either contact me at this email address or Judy at her email address. And if they have other questions about the book or they have questions about the standards or we do have training programs available for districts and states that feel like their um, their or schools that feel like their staff or, 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 or school improvement facilitators are not quite there yet, so there is a curriculum related to this. But the book is a great resource because once you buy the book, Corwin gives you a code and all of the, there's just dozens of uh, tools in it, and you get the, a code where you can go to their website, download those uh, electronic tools, and we have a number of states that they have adopted this for all of their school improvement specialists to use statewide, and they're using those tools. So it's a really uh, cost-effective way for people to get those resources, and we're always willing to answer questions or continue this conversation, and we really want to thank our colleagues at Corwin for making this possible. So this is Judy, uh, and I know that we're coming to an end here, but if anyone has something that's rolling around in your mind or something, uh, you can perhaps ask us now. We have to let uh, uh, Stephanie tell us what our time limits are, uh, but we can also take your questions later. So Stephanie, we can turn this back to you. Sure. I just wanted to um, thank uh, the both of you for uh, taking the time to go through this webinar. It's been very helpful, and I hope the attendees have also found it helpful um, for themselves. I know um, some of you are already clamoring for the slides, so we'll definitely get those out to you as soon as we can. Um, thank you for taking the time out, both to the authors and to the attendees. Um, we will be having a few more webinars um, to help you um, with your practice, so so keep um, keep checking back with Corwin. We'll we'll have a few more. Thank you very Thanks much, everyone. Thank you, everyone.